This is on assignment. This is Everybody. Welcome to the program. I'm Alex Villarreal and here with me as always is Imran Siddiqui. In this episode, we've got stories for you from Britain to Burma. First up, Britain, where terrorism fears are up after the brutal murder of a British soldier on a busy London street. In the U.S., higher education in the virtual world. College classes move online. Viewer talks to the world-famous author of The Kite Runner and other novels about Afghanistan. And we'll go inside America with a web series showcasing fun and fearlessness here in the United States. Today, your assignment is on assignment. Let's go. British Prime Minister David Cameron has described the killing of a soldier in broad daylight on a London street as an attack on Britain and a betrayal of Islam. The two suspects, both of Nigerian descent, are converts to Islam. The men are accused of hacking soldier Lee Rigby to death after running him over with a car. On assignments, Doug Bernard spoke about the shocking attack with VOA's Henry Ridgewell in London. First, some of Henry's report. This is Michael Adebolajo, one of the two suspects in the London attack, appearing in a Kenyan court in 2010. He was accused of seeking training with the terror group Al-Shabaab in neighboring Somalia and deported back to Britain. These people, they are mistreating us and we are innocent, believe me. We are clearly at war! This video has surfaced of Adebolajo, seen here on the far left, attending an Islamist demonstration in 2007. A picture is emerging of young men radicalized on the street and on the internet, says terror expert Brooke Rogers of King's College, London. It's really difficult to understand when somebody's going to move from just talking about things online, attending this type of legal rally, um, espousing more extremist views. One of the uh, uh, groups that these two men are known to have gone on campaigns with and, and marches across London and elsewhere in Britain is called Al Muhajirun and that's headed by a, a preacher called Anjem Chowdhury who has some international repute as, as a fairly radical preacher here who's been in some trouble with the authorities and uh, also on uh, when uh, the, the homecoming parades for troops coming back from Afghanistan and, and previously Iraq there have been demonstrations by uh, these groups like Al Muhajirun in the towns where they're, they're coming back, and so that has created a lot of tension. It appears that that is certainly one of the sources of, of radicalization. But the leader of that group, Anjan Chowdhury, says he had not had contact with either of the accused men uh, for at least two years. So it's that recent two years that appears to be the most critical, how they came from from being involved in groups like that to committing such a, 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 a barbaric and, and graphic crime, allegedly, as they did two weeks ago. It, at times, it seemed that there are, frankly, more TV cameras uh, than followers around people like Anjum Chowdhury and, and some other uh, radical clerics. But perhaps that's not so? I think that's probably a fair point. Radical preachers like Anjan Chowdhury do garner a lot of media coverage, but it's also part of, of, of this uh, debate currently here between uh, what, what is the identity of British society, who should we allow to speak, where do the limits of freedom of speech end, if indeed there are limits to it, and, and what can be done to try and tackle uh, homegrown terrorism, which many experts say pose the biggest danger to people on the streets. You know, there's a parallel here in the United States. A lot of these same questions uh, are being asked about the Tsarnaev brothers uh, who were involved in the Boston Marathon bombing. One of the Tsarnaev brothers, the one who was shot dead, uh, he was actually, it turns out now, uh, involved in a 2011 triple homicide. Uh, he had a record of domestic abuse. So my question is, is it maybe just these guys, maybe just these few individuals, or there's just something wrong with them? I think that's a very valid point. Both men grew up in very gritty, very poor parts of London where street gangs warfare is, uh, w was very prevalent and, and some of them uh, were in, uh, involved in that violence as well. Converts have played a role in a number of terror offences in Britain, says Robin Simcox of the Henry Jackson Society Policy Institute. They feel as if their lives have made, a, made the wrong path um, and that religion has almost been a way out for them uh, initially and then eventually with some individuals it's, it's led to them 
following more extreme interpretations. The London attack has reignited calls for radical Muslim preachers to be banned. Analysts say that as the investigation reveals new details, the debate between freedom of speech and tackling radicalization is likely to intensify. And so there's a lot of interest between whether there's any interplay here between gangs on the street and uh, Islamist extremists uh, uh, and whether uh, extreme groups, extremist preachers uh, can see some easy prey or easy targets or possibly people who may go on to carry out the sort of violent attacks uh, that they implore uh, within gangs. Um, so that, that's part of the police investigation as well, looking at, at the men's background. But certainly um, in this case, it, it, a lot of people are, are saying that this is such a, a barbaric crime that the perpetrators uh, perhaps should be judged not only as, as, as terrorists, as, as the narrative seems to, to be dictating at the moment, but, but also as, as, as street criminals. And again, that was VOA's Henry Ridgewell in London. Now, the dead British soldier, 25-year-old Lee Rigby, was an Army band member and a machine gunner who had served in Afghanistan. He leaves behind a two-year-old son. We're taking a break now. Coming up, the digital revolution in higher education. You're watching On Assignment. Higher education is changing. In the United States, soaring tuition costs and lagging opportunities for graduates have inspired a growing number of online forms of teaching. Online classes are now being taught by many top universities, offering everything from computer programming to the science of cooking. And I'm joined now by viewer Jim Randall, who's been looking at this. Thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. What's the biggest difference or advantage when you compare online teaching versus traditional teaching? Well, the most obvious advantage is for a student, you can go anytime you want. You can attend a class at any university that offers them from anywhere. It doesn't matter if you live in Ouagadougou or New York or Kansas City or Tokyo. You can go at 3 in the morning, 3 in the afternoon, whenever you want. So I could be sitting anywhere in the world, log in online and study. As long as you've got internet access, you can go to school. That's fantastic. So let's look at your story and then we'll come back. Okay. This is pretty amazing. You That's the University of Virginia's David Evans teaching an online introduction to computer science. Online classes are now taught by many top universities and offer everything from computer programming to the science of cooking. Many classes are either free or inexpensive and are updated more quickly than regular college curricula. That's important to the millions of students who learn technical and other skills from Lynda.com. Co-founder Linda Weinman spoke to VOA via Skype. Is we can come to market very quickly and we teach transient skills. So a lot of software is changing constantly or new software is being invented. And those sorts of things can't easily make them make their way into college curriculum. Another difference, instead of the professor lecturing to students, who then do research, study and homework alone, online classes flip that around, according to student and blogger John Haber, who said in a Skype interview, he's taking enough online classes to earn a four-year college degree in just one year. They're watching the lectures at home uh, as homework, recorded lectures, and then when they get to class, they're having more active discussions or interactions with the teachers or working on projects. Experts say the new technology will have a major impact on colleges and some predict future classes may be a blend of online lectures and professors helping students work through difficult problems in person. And we're back with Jim Randall. Jim, do you think online education is a game changer for higher education? It certainly could be. I mean, we've seen digital change journalism, publishing, music, uh, retail. I mean, it has, it has made huge changes in these important parts of the economy. There's no reason to think that it couldn't have some kind of impact on higher education. The other thing that's actually kind of interesting is Traditionally, the professor stands in front of the class and gives a lecture, and everybody's gathered together, and then they go separately to their, their rooms, to the library, whatever, and they work individually. Here, you can uh, watch the lecture online at your convenience, and then people gather together and talk to the professor because they're stuck on problem six, or they want to do the lab, or they've got a question about something. So it kind of turns the, the, the education model on its head. Okay, and what do you think the future classroom would look like? I suspect 
uh, or what people tell me that I've interviewed, is that it's likely to be a blend of traditional um, classes as well as online tools. And the, some of these uh, experiments are ending up with new and more interesting ways of teaching, and that's, that's in its infancy. We're likely to see different ways of teaching, and they're going to try things out. Either they work, some will work, some will not, and obviously the ones that work, hopefully, will propagate. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Viewer is Jim Randell. Coming up, our reporter talks with the author of world-famous novels about Afghanistan. You're watching On Assignment. U.S. author Khaled Hosseini writes novels about his country of birth, Afghanistan. Hosseini's first novel, The Kite Runner, was a number one bestseller, and his follow-up book, A Thousand Splendid Sons, was on the New York Times bestseller list for nearly an entire year. Hosseini's third novel is called And the Mountains Echoed. VOA's Milena Djurjic recently got a one-on-one -on -one interview with Hosseini to talk about the book, his writing, and life in Afghanistan. On Assignments, Rebecca Ward caught up with Milena to find out more about Hosseini and his latest project. Every time I go to Afghanistan, I, I see these people from all walks of life, from all over the world, Bosnia, Greece, somewhere else, who have left behind their lives and come to Kabul to help these people. And partly I wanted to acknowledge that, acknowledge that you know, the, the, the campaign in Afghanistan has been painted as largely an American one, and, and I understand, and there's for very good reasons. But on the aid delivery side of it, you know, it's such a multinational, international effort, and you see people from all walks of life. And I kind of wanted to pay homage to that. How does he feel when he goes to visit Afghanistan after being away for so many years and, and uh, you know, seeing the refugees? you know, the poverty and the destruction just caused by the war. Well, he's saying he, he does have a feeling of guilt. Uh, and he used an interesting expression, genetic lottery, because he was saying due to genetic lottery, he was lucky enough to, to get out of the country on time, to, um, to grow up in a family that allowed him to kind of develop and be able to write and be this successful. And he said, you can't do that if you're a refugee in Pakistan. So he does feel some, he does feel a lot, a lot of guilt and uh, probably like all the immigrants at some point, but he's doing a lot for his country. He, he has established a foundation that helps women, children, refugees in his home country. He's acting as a goodwill ambassador for Afghanistan, doing a lot of good work. So I think he's trying to kind of pour some of his success back to his and give it back to, to the people and to the country where he, grew, where he was born. I don't think interest in Afghanistan really drives interest in my books, maybe for some people. But I think what draws people to my books is um, the fact that my books deal with things that are very universal. P um, there's a aspects of the human experiences where, which are on the pages of my book that people can see themselves in. You know, it reflects something about life as people understand it, regardless of whether they're from Montenegro or Bosnia <laughs> or France or Poland or whatever. I guess I was wondering if he felt motivated to talk about these controversial issues or these issues that aren't talked about in Afghanistan. Yes, and, and he was saying that uh, what gives him the, the, the sort of the motive, to f except, uh, especially for writing this third book, is that he hears a lot of those stories when he goes on his trips, as a, when he went on his trips as a goodwill ambassador. He hears these heartbreaking stories. And he was saying that I'm, he's sitting with villagers who tell him calmly that they had like seven or eight kids die only freezing to death. So he feels an urge, and probably comes back to that guilt that he's feeling, he feels an urge to tell people in the world what's going on in Afghanistan. But I guess this time he decided to take it up a notch and take it more personal than, than, than in his previous two books, although his previous two books were really emotional as well. In his latest book, he had kind of more of an international cast, and you actually asked him about why, and what was his answer? 
Well, there, he said that he met, that he wanted kind of widen his perspective, but again, he on his trips to Afghanistan, he met a lot of people who were helping Afghanistan rebuild from all over the world. So he thought it might be interesting to have all those international characters in his book. As I mentioned in an interview, he even has a Bosnian nurse named Amra. For, for me, that was actually very interesting. It's probably going to be very interesting for his readers in the Balkans. I even asked him, did he knew Bosnian? And he said he met some Bosnians working for, for humanitarian organizations, and he really appreciated what they are doing for his home country. What I wanted the book to be was uh, kind of like listening to a choir, except you put your ear to each individual voice, and you hear each voice, and then when you pull back, you have collectively heard this one big song. And so how did you, I, I just kind of on a personal note, how did you feel talking to him? I mean, what was his persona like? He was actually great. As I said, he, that day he was doing back-to-back -back interviews. So I was thinking, he, he, by the time he comes to, you know, to talk to us, he's going to be very tired. And it's probably similar questions and everything. But he was great. He was very energetic. He was very engaging. He was very kind. It's like you're not interviewing somebody, you're talking to somebody, you're having just like a regular conversation. And our thanks again to VOA Serbian service reporter Milena Djurjic. Of course, there's always another side to every story, and Hosseini's case is no different. Despite the immense popularity of his writings, the VOA Afghan service tells us that the reaction to the kite runner in Afghanistan was severe, with Afghan writers and officials saying it contradicted the values of Afghan culture. Moving on, can you make a TV show out of making a sandwich? Maybe if you're a host of Inside America, a program about American life featuring VOA's Tala Hadavi and Arash Arabasadi. Inside America has followed Tala and Arash as they learn to scuba dive, climb a rock wall, or even take on a professional fighter. We wanted to hear more about their show, and fortunately, I didn't have to get in the boxing ring to do it. Take a look. <laughs> A lot of your segments are extremely physical. I mean, you're out there, you were at the roller derby, out there with the roller girls, you were fighting a mixed martial artist. So what's the craziest experience that you've had filming? Yeah, well, I mean, I guess I would say that it is uh, a little scary to have somebody who fights for a living charging at you and attacking you. So that was, uh, that was a little crazy and I had a headache for a couple days. <laughs> Everything we do is very physical. We both like to do be very active. And how would you describe your audience? Who are you who are you doing this for? Really everyone. We the, the goal is to reach everyone at VOA, all the 45 language services. That's why we really originally did it. And really we saw it as an opportunity to show American life to people who will probably never have the opportunity to experience the things like roller derby, like stepping into a cage with a professional fighter. So it's we, we're taking you on a ride that maybe you can't otherwise take. They're really very much showing American culture to an audience that's outside of the U.S. Yeah, I mean, it's things that for us are sometimes just a phone call away, that for a lot of our audience, it's literally a world away. Our sandwich showdown came about as, uh, as a result of a story that I'd done at VOA a few years ago. Um, got a lot of hits, called, it, called up the owner and said, you know, I think you owe me a favor. He said, what do you want? And then that's when we did the sandwich showdown. I want to be proud of VOA after this. Messy food is great. It was really funny because we got um, Lin Yang from the Mandarin Service and um, Ramon Taylor from Latam. Latam, and you know, uh, Lin had never made a sandwich in her life. It was perfect. As a female myself, seeing how how well you dominated that wall, and then <laughs> the you. contrast with <laughs> yes, with Arash. So describe that experience. Well, I mean, we got there right away, and Tala's a really good sport about being a guinea pig. I mean, she's uh, she's a former athlete, so I mean, we're we're kind of using that to our advantage of okay, we'll go ahead and throw our harness on, we'll see you climb a wall, and you know, she's coming down, so it's your turn, and we'll look over to our friend and our executive producer, Dean, who says, it's your turn. I mean, I, I didn't think I was going to be climbing a wall. <laughs> oh, no. uh, I would have probably worn different shoes, maybe gloves oh, or something. Yeah, I, 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 I was at this advantage. Yeah. 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 You know, yeah, maybe had a lighter breakfast or something. That's know. what happened, yes, of right. course. <laughs> so if people want to see you, if viewers out there have not seen your segments and they want to find you, where should they go? 
Facebook is definitely the number one way to reach us. We're always writing people back. Well, the first couple months that we uh, launched the website, the Facebook page, we got like 7,500 fans. Your fundamental message sort of that you hope people take away from watching these segments, what would that be? I think as a woman, at least, I think a lot of our audience don't get a chance to do a lot of these things. And I think, uh, especially working at PNN for three years now, I get a lot of feedback from the women that are like just impressed or inspired by the fact that I do get on a uh, rock climbing wall or something like that. And I, I really hope to spread that more and make f women around the world feel like they can do anything just like the men, you know, and win. <laughs> <laughs> And for you, I think it's even a, probably more than just the courage to be able to do it, but the freedom to go do it, which a lot of our audience, I and mean, we take it for granted here in the U.S. that we can go do a co-ed activity. And another part is like being comfortable with looking silly. It's yeah. okay, you know, we don't have to look so girly girly and make up and dolled up all the time. Like, I, so I'm comfortable, formal. yeah. Yeah. Well, the fans, anything for you guys, literally. <laughs>A lot of fun there with VOA's Tala Hadavi and Arash Arabasadi. You can find all of their video adventures on Facebook by searching Inside America VOA. And next time, I'll be the one to have fun with them. Mm, I don't know. We'll okay. See. okay, we'll see. We'll see. Asia's newest biggest tourist attraction is Burma. The country, also known as Myanmar, is experiencing a surge in foreigners eager to visit places that have been closed off for decades. But the spike in tourists and new industries is taking an environmental toll. At Burma's scenic Inlay Lake, rapid development is straining the ecosystem. Reporter Steve Sanford has the story. Inlay Lake is considered a jewel of Burma, where migrating birds, rare animal species, and a handful of Burmese tribes share space around the 110 square kilometer freshwater reservoir. Now, a steady stream of foreign tourists is arriving. And although that means big business for some, many locals say they are losing out. Floating tomato gardens are the primary cash crop in this area, comprising more than 60% of the local agriculture. Farmer Mi Intera says he welcomes foreign visitors, but not the increased traffic. The constant waves from the increase in motorboats are destroying my crops on the lake. Adding to the problem, diesel fuel from the boats mixed with excessive amounts of pesticide already used by the farmers is threatening drinking supplies. Kin Mokau says his family and others living on the lake's islands say they now must fetch clean water from elsewhere. The people who have motorboats can go to get drinking water easily, but some of the villagers only have rowboats and cannot get to the water supply, so they get sick from drinking dirty water. As unregulated development and business moves forward, local environmentalists are also worried about an even bigger potential environmental disaster. Kun Chanki, an environmentalist with the Pao Youth Organization, says that waste from an open cast coal mine 13 kilometers away is ending up in Inlay Lake's watershed, making matters worse. Most of the people in the community rely on the upper below creek. Mm. They use the water for their bathing and drinking and like mm. traveling, yeah. They mm -hmm. use just one. So it's very dangerous for them mm. because of this mining or the water pollution from the dead, this mining. Mm -hmm. Also it can affect the inlet lake. As tourism and development continue unabated, Burma's second largest freshwater lake and the people that live on it stand to lose much more. Steve Sanford reporting for VOA News from Inlay Lake. And with that, it's time for us to say goodbye. But if you liked that story, we'll have more environmental news for you next week when we look at a controversial dam project in Cambodia that some say will have damaging environmental effects. And also, we'll be bringing you updates from Afghanistan from a reporter in Kabul. Check out all of our episodes, past and present, on VOANews.com, Facebook, and YouTube. And if you're watching on a YouTube player, get accurate English captions straight from our scripts by clicking on CC in the player window. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time.